Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where our only psychopathy is trying to get you to accept yourself as a vibrant and powerful force in nature. I am your host, Ryan Peverly, the psychotherapist with an emphasis on the psycho. Welcome to the Neuro Linguistic Program. Thank you for being here. This time around, we welcome into the house Andrew Austin. Andrew has been a psychotherapist since 1994 and has authored the best-selling book, The Rainbow Machine, Tales from a Neuro Linguist Journal, which has drawn comparisons to both Robert Anton Wilson and NLP co-creator Richard Bandler. Andrew also has a lifelong interest in magic and mysticism. He's an ordained minister for the Church of Subgenius, second degree initiate into the Ordo Templi Orientis, trainee member in the Builders of the Adidum, member of the Order of Odd Fellows and the Masonic Philosophical Society, and the chief executive for the Order of the Historia Ilius Itineris International. Hope I pronounced that all right. Now, Andrew has developed a bit of a different approach to psychotherapy. He's combined his interest in magic and mysticism with psychology and neurolinguistic programming, NLP, to offer clients an alternative to the numbing, ineffective pharmaceutical prescriptions we all love to hate. And that is the basis for our chat here today. It's a rather productive conversation that touches on psychotherapy's religious structure, psychedelics, the aforementioned neurolinguistic programming, Solomonic evocations, and Andrew's disdain for new agey spiritual and healing practices. So if you're about to do a chakra cleanse, maybe tune that part out. But the rest you should absolutely tune in for. So let's do the damn thing already and cast this pod off deep into the psychological circle of provocation where an evocation of bail may just bail you out of a traumatic situation. Did you see what I did there? Bail. The demon. Bail. The verb. Playing on words. Ah, fuck it. Enjoy. Andrew Austin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Ryan. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely, man. We, uh, We chatted briefly... At the beginning of another episode, several months ago, I, I think it was episode 39, which when I look back on what that was about, uh, Demon Conjuring and Possession was uh, the show that you cameoed at the beginning of. <laughs> I think it was rather appropriate that you were the lead into that chat. Uh, but let's dig a little bit further into who you are and what you do before we get into demons and things like that. Uh, you're a therapist. I am indeed. You're also a magician of sorts. I don't yep. know how much practice you actually do, but we can talk about that, obviously. The reason you're here, though, the reason that I find this so fascinating, or, or find you so fascinating, is you combine magic with your therapy to help people overcome depression and trauma. So, I'm a comic book guy. I need the origin story of Andrew Austin, therapist slash magician. So, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in psychology and magic, and then what gave you the idea to fuse the two together? Wow. Okay, trip down memory lane. Here, here is where it all began. Arthur C. Clarke, the mysterious world book that I picked up or somebody gave to me when I was about seven or eight years old. You may be familiar. It's a black cover and it's got a crystal skull on the front. Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. It was a TV series. Now, cut a very long story short, a fairly ordinary child in a very, very ordinary neighborhood with a very ordinary family who didn't want to do ordinary. I had all the standard kid stuff going on. And um, this book was like, there is a world out there that's different. It's weird. It's, it's not what I'm being offered. So that began my interest, that there was something out there that was different. Um, I then was sort of very much into all of the weird and wonderful Fortiana, strange phenomena. As a teenager, I then came across a book, Encyclopedia on Witchcraft. And in the back of that book was a chapter, it was the last chapter, on the wickedest man in the world, Alistair Crowley. Now, that was the chapter that caught my interest. No idea who he was. Didn't know any no other experience of it, but I thought, okay, here is something that's different. This is, it caught my interest. And then it began. I then, at around about 1819, joined a Kabbalistic lodge, which was fairly local to me. Um, I was a student nurse at the time, and then really started with my Kabbalah studies when I should have been studying at the hospital. And I was reading but more sort of Crowley and Dean of Fortune and, and those sort of writers. From there, I discovered hypnotherapy. 
And then I discovered NLP and counseling, and I then got into therapy, leaving, leaving a lot of the magic stuff behind. For several years, worked as a therapist, um, developed all sorts of things, and then ended up going full circle back to magic again. And that's where I am today. So I kind of started off in magic, went into therapy and psychology, back to magic. So you have your own therapy practice, right? Yes, I do. But it's a virtual practice. I don't have a building that I work from. It's not like I have a clinic or anything else, but I do a lot of client work. My, my main income is through doing one-to-one -one work with clients and also in training. I train therapists in, in therapy. Okay. So the last part of that first question was, when did you get the idea to fuse the two practices together, therapy and magic? You know, what stood out about both disciplines that you saw wow, there might be some crossover here. And it, was, it came from the, the, the manufacturing of demons and the, the, the demonology thing. So what I became aware of is that we anthropomorphize um, thought forms. And on, on the Mentims program, one of the things I talk about is how we anthropomorphize depression. So we start off saying, um, I feel depressed. Then we go to, I have depression. And then eventually, after a number of transforms, it becomes the depression ruins my life. The depression follows me everywhere I go. So we give the depression a life of its own. It's anthropomorphized. Now, what I began to do was I was looking at the area of metaphors, which is where my therapeutic work is predominantly based. So I do metaphors of movement is the, the name of the, the work that I do. And I started to look at, OK, so a lot of this stuff actually looks the same as demonology in that we work with people's metaphors, which are largely anthropomorphized, and we can work with those metaphors in exactly the same way as in the grimoires I and mean, in a lot of the world religions would address these things. So I started to see, okay, what if we took magic and religion and their processes merely as a metaphor, and we use those metaphors to deal with people's metaphorical representation of the problem? We have a solution that's actually in the same category of information as the representation of the problem itself. And I started then to, to play with those two things. And then the work that I do now emerged from that. Yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned manufacturing demons. I, I did have a note here that I wanted to talk about that for a moment. So since it came up, I'd like to dig a little deeper into that, you know, this difference between I feel, I have, and I am. Language is very powerful. And I don't know if this is the direction that you're coming from, but I know that, like, when I think about myself, if I tell myself I am sad, I feel like I'm describing myself as like that's my existence. Like I have a sad existence. I am a sad person and I, there's nothing I can do to get around that. Whereas if I say, well, I am feeling sadness, then it's just a sort of temporary or momentary experience. Like, yes, I'm allowing myself to feel that emotion of sadness or anger or whatever, but it's going to pass and it doesn't define who I am psychologically, for example. So I'm just wondering if you could explain to us, you know, from a therapist perspective, how powerful this language is and how uh, important it is that we use the right language to describe our state of mind. Okay, so we look at the difference between I am sad and I feel sad. I feel sad is a, is a part body feeling. So this is not this is a partial what's known as a partial affectation. So it doesn't it, it's not the in some totality of me. There's I who experiences a part of myself being sad. But if I am equal to depression, I am depressed or I am sad, then that's an identity statement. So one is simply a reporting of kinesthetics, the other one is an identity. Now, linguistically, these things get taught to us. So we get taught that if you, if you feel sad and you see a diagnosing clinician or you're in a culture where diagnosis of these things turns it into an identity, then what you can start to learn to do is to say, well, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sad or I'm depressed. I have depression. I have a, have a disorder. Therefore, I am a depressive. Now, this is where it starts to get really, really strange, because you can have the identity of the disorder, but never have a symptom of the disorder. For example, I can be an alcoholic, even though I haven't drunk alcohol for 40 years. So I don't have, there's no trace of the behavior inside me that would define me to be an alcoholic, but I retain the alcoholic identity level. I can be somebody who drinks to excess, to an unhealthy excess, but not identify as an alcoholic. So I can have the behavior without the identity. The same thing can happen with any aspect of any experience, is that we have the, the identity role that goes with it, but we also have the behavior itself. Now, most people have no concept of the difference between the two. They, 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 they don't realize that actually they don't have to have the identity. Now, some disorders are always going to be phrased as an identity. 
If I just use a, 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 an abstract here, with things like HIV, the person is an HIV person. They, they are HIV positive. They don't have HIV. But with cancer, that's not an identity. Cancer is a part body experience. Somebody has cancer. We don't say they are a cancer or they're cancer positive at an identity level. So it's asking it quite confusing. There's lots of social politics around different experiences, different identities, different conditions. And then we, we can put that same into emotions. Those, some emotions are allowed. You're allowed to feel that, but only if you have the identity role that goes with it. So some of us may say something like, so when we're young, we say to our parents, I feel sad. Don't be so silly. What have you got to be sad about? If it, it gets dismissed. Um, if, you're a, if you're a depressive in a psychiatric unit, you could be somebody who is a depressive who shows no signs of depression, but you're always going to be depressed as an identity level. I'm wondering then, does this identity have anything to do with the, well, I'm sure it all connects on some level, but maybe you could tell us how it does. But this idea of the self-image and our own preconceived belief systems that we may be clinging to on some level. How do these other areas of the psyche, beliefs, self-image, tie into our use of language here and this, this identity language that we've been talking about? So what we see happen a lot when people first become aware of these concepts is they say, oh, I mustn't say I'm, I'm a depressive. I must say I have depression or I feel depressed. Merely changing the way we report it back to ourselves doesn't change the experience that we're reporting on. So whilst it's induced through language and culture, merely changing the language and culture doesn't change the experience. And so we have to be careful that we're not getting into affirmations or the, the politics of language where we must use the correct words or we offend ourselves or, or somebody else's sensitivity. But is, one of the things to look at is how we have identity. What, is, what are we? What is, what is identity? And how does, how does identity represent itself? And a lot of it, again, is taught to us. So, for example, my parents might call me Drew. They might have this, this notion of their son, Drew, and have a story about Drew. Now, through that, they have a number of examples of the kind of child or adult that Drew is based on their experience, which is a highly edited portion of experience. But what happens if I, Andy, present a different identity to the one by which I'm known? Now we have a source of conflict, but it's a conflict that people don't understand. There might be a, a slight tension in the room. There might be a slight discomfort. We may mismatch communication towards each other. So as a result of those kind of interactions, we start to shape how we relate to each other and how we relate ourselves to each other. So we hold each other in these, these identity politics. If I then come out and say, actually, I'm not that person you think I am. I'm this person. That may get dismissed or ignored or acknowledged and then ignored again quickly after. And we can find ourselves in a situation where we're constantly having to re-explain our identity to people. And then we have others who know us to be that identity and treat us accordingly to as being that person. So if I could jump in here, in your example here with your parents, is their idea of you being formed by what they're actually experiencing with you or from you? Or are they creating the persona of Drew in their minds and projecting it onto you? It's a combination of both because it's a two-way process. It's not, it's not entirely one way, but it may be biased more to one way than the other. So I'll give you an example. One of the reasons I believe that I'm quite successful in life comes down to a very, very small number of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with me and everything to do with chance. So, for example, my initials are AA, and my first name is Andrew, and Andrew was the first disciple of Jesus. Now, in and of itself, inconsequential. But when I started at school, and I went to a religious school, whenever we moved as a group of children in and out of a classroom, we always had to line up in alphabetical order, boy, girl, boy, girl. So for about 10 years of my life in school, I was always at the front of the queue. I was always the first one out of the room. I was always the first one into the room, simply from a thing of an issue. Now, as a result, if I walked quickly, everyone behind me walked quickly. If I walked slowly, everyone behind me walked slowly. I was automatically positioned as the guy who's up front and leading the group. Zachariah Zebedee, who's right at the back, 
He goes through 10 years of school yeah. being a follower who's always at the back and doesn't learn to influence the group of people in these very simple ways. Now, it's a religious school. I've got a Christian name, the first disciple of Jesus. I'm first again just because of my name. My friends were Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, lots of Dave, several Christophers and quite a few Pauls. We were the Christian children with Christian names. But Keith, Martin, Trevor, Wayne, Derek and Dean didn't have Christian names. Now, in that portion of our society back then in the 70s, the kids with the Christian names were the white, middle class, well-to-do families who went to the religious school. Derek, Dean, Wayne, Martin, Keith, Trevor, Terry, no Christian names. They were the kids from the other side of the tracks. And as a result, they weren't expected to behave themselves because they didn't come from white middle class families who went to church and Christian schools. So the expectation set of the teachers upon us was very different to the expectation set upon them. Now, combine that with simply me now being at the front of the queue, I'm one of the good kids. I'm automatically in that position of responsibility and because of my name, I'm one of the good kids. And so it goes on. Now, that starts to shape how we see ourselves. It also shapes how we interact with all the people, which then in turn shapes how we see ourselves. So it starts really early. One other little detail, and again, it's so trivial, but it's a massive impact. Just before I started school, my mother made sure I could read and write and do basic maths. So when I started school, I'm amongst all these children who haven't had that input. And we're only a sort of about two weeks worth of education difference. They're still doing the ABCs because they're still learning the alphabet because they haven't been taught that by their parents. And I'm the one who's helping them. So right from my very first day, I'm regarded as one of the clever kids, position of authority, and I'm helping other people. I'm five years old. So automatically, my role in society is being established. Now, these are very subtle little identity things that we don't control or have any say over because we just inherit these things randomly. And yet the effect is phenomenal. And while I'm on this one, I have to say one other. There was a guy called Mark. Now, he was the youngest child, not just in the in the class, but in the entire year. But for one hour difference on his birth date, for one hour difference, he would have gone from being the youngest child in the year of his schooling for all those years at school to having gone to school the year later and have been the eldest. How different would his life have been with all of those school, school experiences being so different just based on one hour of his birth? Now, if you span that out just on the birth order and birth dates into astrology, now we'll start to see some interesting patterns emerge. And I know some studies have been done around astrological dates and the school calendar and when the, the school year begins and, and ends. So this is all part of the identity politics that we work with, is where does the, where does the identity come from? And actually, how does it interact and how does it shape um, then how we live our lives? Do you think that then, like you said, that, that your success has been based off chance and, and obviously, you know, having the last name Austin, you know, having your parents give you the name Andrew set you up for some really interesting experiences, which is what you're just talking about. How have those experiences then translated into your work with magic and psychology? So as a result of sort of my, my psychology understanding, I, I looked a lot about identity and also around status um, because people, the status politics of social interaction is enormous. Once I'd learned a lot about status, and an awful lot of that came from the field of acting and improvisation, I then started looking at status in magic. So we have, we work very much in a magical hierarchy. So we've got the gods up the top, and then archangels, angels. Somewhere in the middle, we've got man, and then we go down into the demon hierarchy, and we're sort of in between. And so we work with these hierarchies. If we're working Kabbalistically, we have hierarchies within hierarchies. So we've got the four worlds, and then you have the 12 Sapphira, and, and, and all the permutations that come with that. So then what we can start to do is to look at the hierarchies that exist inside how people think. So in order to have one set of thoughts, and this, is, this goes into set theory, and, and forgive me if I'm going off way off in a tangent, but in order to have one set of thoughts, another set of thoughts must pre-exist and vice versa, because things are nested within things, much like in the tree of life. So what I'm able to do is to start to, to make calculations on people's communication and what they're offering me in order to understand other aspects of what they're not either conscious of or not communicating in that moment. It's probably easier to demonstrate than try and explain. I and mean, if, if I try and do it, we'll be here forever. But largely, I think the, the, the magic side of stuff has given me an understanding of how to work with thought forms. And it's given me a different set of language structures by which to understand things. 
I think I also just add when I'm working clinically with people, no client will ever know that I'm I'm using sort of occult science or Kabbalistic principles or magic principles in what I'm doing. Um, I always keep everything phrased within a psychological paradigm. The last thing I want to be start doing is okay, I can understand you you're feeling a bit depressed there. You might have a depressed demon. Let's exorcise this and invoke a, a helper. I don't think that's going to go down so well. Well, that's interesting because I was watching the videos on your website, and I, I think those are for members or you know paying clients or whatever. So I appreciate the access to that. But you are teaching people in those videos, you know, how to draw a magic circle, uh, you know, how yes. to use the triangle of art. So you don't introduce those practices to your clients then, or what? Not, not as a therapist. I keep, I tend to keep the therapeutic discipline and my magic discipline quite separate. I think as a, as a therapist, I'm not going to talk magic. As a magician, I will talk a lot of therapy, as well as probably a lot of nonsense at the same time. Um, so I have to keep them di- keep them very different. I can't really go into a clinical setting or work with somebody who's working with a, a hierarchy of psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and all the rest of it, and, and introduce them to say the the lesser banishing ritual. Um, <laughs> that that could take some very interesting career changes for me. That said. I don't think that these things should be mutually exclusive. Um, I'm just aware that I have to dress in the clothes of the culture through which I move and blend in. That, that's probably quite an important thing. But I do think a lot of the magic stuff is, is very, very relevant to an awful lot of mental health stuff. So you're not directly fusing magic and psychology together so your patients or clients can, like, they're not seeing that that fusion. It's more behind the scenes and how yes. you work and how you present right. possible treatment options to them. Let me give an example. And if we look at things like psychosis and schizophrenia, and we take a particular aspect of that, which is when people have an auditory or visual hallucination. So the, the person who is, say, having a – they're hearing a voice and usually the voice is persecuting them or giving a commentary about something or just basically driving them nuts. They're the one thinking that thing. It's not like it's an abstract part of the brain or you know some eth- esoteric thing is happening. Whilst the, the schizophrenic says, I hear a voice – supposing the voice says, I hate you. I hear a voice that says, I hate you. The normal person would say, I think I hate you. It is that the, the schizophrenic has learned to have linguistic phrasing that dissociates it from their core identity and core experience. So they have literally dissociated a part of themselves, largely through language, because these voices aren't always external to themselves. And then they're hearing back their own thoughts as though it's disembodied. Now, what we tend to do, of course, is to say that's a clinical disorder that must be medicated away. Or, you know, we engage them in treatment programs and and, and all sorts of things. Usually it's it's medication based. What if we did something else? And instead of seeing them as a, as a, a victim or a patient with an illness to be treated, we saw them as a very poor magician. So this is a person who has evoked a thought form and lost control of it. They have managed to evoke something that is not very nice because they they very rarely have these positive hallucinations that come back and are all lovely and give them a nice time and give them really good advice. It's usually really shitty stuff that comes back at them. So they've evoked something by accident, probably, and now they've lost control of it. So rather than, say, frame them to be a patient, let's frame them as a bad magician and start teaching them magical principles. So what are the resources in order to get control back of this thought form? What are the resources that they're going to need to invoke in order to greater strengthen their their sphere of experience, their their aura, their person? What what resources do they need to invoke in order to better negotiate and bring that thought form back under control? And essentially what we're looking at doing is not necessarily banishing it out of the sphere of experience, but bringing it back and integrating it. It sounds to me, if we actually look at the formula for doing that, that's just like working in evocation. Now, we can do that therapeutically without having to use the archaic language of the old grimoire magicians and and, you know, and all the magic and occult stuff. There's plenty of ways we can just do this conversationally. So when I think of thought forms or tulpas maybe, I think of those as things that you could actually physically create and then they become objects or physical entities, but you also use the term hallucinations in your explanation there. So as a magician and as a therapist, are we creating physical entities? Are we creating physical thought forms? Or are all of these hallucinations of the brain? I I get caught in this one because some days I go, do you know what? I think 
these aren't just located specifically in the brain. And there is stuff that's external to self. There is stuff that was out there in the environment because it's picked up by other people and people interact with it. And then other days I think, ah, oh, that's all nonsense, of course. People are always misled by sensory stimulus and they get confused and you know, your brain's always fooling you into seeing things that aren't there and all the rest of it. But then I think, okay, well, that's happening. Doesn't dis- Just because that happens, it doesn't dismiss the objectivity. And then I think, okay, psychology model versus objective model. I don't know. I would love to, I think I'd like to be able to go, yep, I absolutely know that it's this. But every time I do, and I, I settle on that position, a counterexample comes along and demonstrates something that actually, that can't be right. <laughs> that shouldn't be happening. It doesn't fit. So I think in answer to that, I don't actually know if it's one or the other, a bit of both, or even if it's not neither of those and it's something else entirely. I don't like to get caught in the, 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 the very modern idea of, well, you don't need to know how electricity works in order to use it. Don't get caught up in the explanations, because I think that can lead us to naivety and gullibility. And there's, there's way too much of that, both in magic and in the psychology field. This, this is too much of that going on. Blind faith and all the rest. So I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know, because I, I, yeah. If I carry on talking, I would just keep going back and forth. I don't know. I, don't know what I, was say, I mean, that that's completely fair because I don't think anybody who claims to know these things, I wouldn't trust people like that, to be honest. So it's just something that how can you know? I mean, I think you know in a sense of within your own experience. Have you seen the movie Ghostbusters? Yeah. Okay. So if I created something like the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man in my own life, and I saw it walking down the street up towards the door to my house, that to me looks like a real thing. It looks like a physical entity that's walking toward me. But how can I be so sure? You know, if that thing doesn't actually approach me and touch me and I can touch it, what is it then? I mean, it could be a hallucination. So although I think in the movie it was real because it was like raining marshmallow on everybody and they were all (laughs) covered in marshmallow goo. Hey, but that's a great uh, example, though, of someone creating a thought form and it coming to life and everybody else experiencing it. So I think, way off topic here, maybe. But well, we, we do have lots and lots of examples. It also leads into the identity politics. And if you look in the advertising industry and particularly around the notion of branding, a powerful brand doesn't physically exist anywhere because we can, we can create a brand without a product. And I know some companies have done that in the past. They create the brand first and then find a product to fill if that brand is successful. And brands can spread like a like a virus. This is the original use of the word meme before it became a, a thing for describing pictures on the Internet. Um, a meme will spread like a thought virus through a population and across borders very, very fast. I mean, it's astonishing speed. And that's the power of advertising and and branding is we're putting a picture into people's heads. What interests me is the speed of transmission of some of these things. And I've got a, I've got a, a really way out there sort of example that I see, I see in parallel with this. And it was the thing at school. I could be in, I was in a school of 1,500 children. This is a big school. Hasted there, but a big school. And there's going to be a fight at break time. And how fast does that information spread through these children? The whole freaking school knows in seconds there's going to be a fight and who's going to be having that information just it's phenomenal but not only that this information is very target specific because 1500 kids in the school can know and not one adult gets that information so we have very targeted bit of information and and it spreads very very fast now it seems that these things move through culture and move through people that quickly as though it's almost like it doesn't rely on the human factor for the idea to spread. Um, so I think it just, there's lots of things that happen that, and we see lots of examples of this in pop, in culture where we have this sudden spontaneous event across a whole country where everyone has the same sort of idea, the same feel. The power of ritual does this as well with, with things like Christmas. So maybe there is stuff that actually transmits external to people. Well, that's or maybe interesting... there's a subspace field that connects all the minds and it's transmitted through that way. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting uh, analogy, you know, bringing up memes and memetics and meme magic. You know, I'm sure that you were aware of the, the whole story when, when Trump was running for president, the whole Pepe the Frog meme that a lot of people on the internet claimed was the reason that he was elected. You know, they were using this meme magic to put him in office. And what do you make of things like that, especially with the internet involved now? Obviously, memetics go back to 
maybe the 70s or so. I'm not sure exactly when that term was coined, but I think it was in the late 70s. It has a bit of a different meaning, obviously, as you touched on than, you know, just pictures on the internet. But is that sort of cultural information transfer, is that a viable psychological phenomenon? I think it is. I think the internet has, has enabled information to transmit in far greater volume at far greater speeds to larger numbers of people. And not all of that information is good information. So there's an awful lot of nonsense. I would say Facebook is the great way of finding out how clever people are in terms of what they repost. Do they? Because <laughs> an awful lot of a lot of nonsense ideas spread very, very fast. Lots of hoaxes and urban myths and urban legends, that kind of stuff. I think there's another thing that can happen, though. And I think I'm seeing this a lot in the magic scene. And it's people reverse engineering a concept. There's, I, there is a name for this. And I can't remember what it's called now. So essentially, a phenomena has happened, as all phenomena do, and it wasn't the one people were expecting uh, or you know, people have been led to expect. And so what happens is now people find the explanation for it. And after over time, and it can happen, the time it takes is much shorter now because of the, the mass communications of, of things like social media. A notion starts to, people settle on this concept, and that then becomes the prevailing idea that then gets repeated and shared. So I think a lot of stuff that we see is actually reverse engineered. The thing happened, and now this is the explanation we try and find. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily just just the, the only explanation. I think is things do catch on very quickly. Are you familiar with the term psychomancy? You might need to explain that one to me. Kind of like soul communication or spirit communication. Mancy at the end of that makes it sound like it's a divinatory practice, but I'm not really sure that it is. But I thought of it the other day when I was watching some of your videos and I was I was thinking just in terms of, you know, magic and psychology. Is this all just us here communicating back with our soul? Is everything that we're experiencing here just a projection from some other place? I'm not really sure if I want to talk about that. It was just something that popped into my head. But talk to us a little bit about belief systems, specifically maybe religious belief systems or scientism. How are these institutions, how do they affect our psyche? Just to an unbelievable degree and to a point of exasperation on my part. The, the problem about beliefs is that the, the prominence they are given, the importance they're given in culture. And there's nothing new to this. This, is, this has always been the case. To offend a belief can get you killed. Now, there was a point in time in most of the world where it could literally get you killed. And, and still parts of the world today, just simply offend a belief will still get you killed. Now it can get you shamed. You can be called out on the internet and then have a, have a hate campaign against you. But the, the problem with beliefs is they're just a set of thoughts that people like having. People choose their beliefs. They even use this, go, well, I choose to believe, but such and such. Well, I was raised to believe. And they literally are just choices that people make. And as long as I can frame the thoughts I like having as a belief, I now have power over you and anyone else. Because I can say, you should respect my beliefs, you should respect all beliefs, and you've offended me, and now I've got power of you, and I can banish you, or go be gone because you're offending me, which is nuts. But unfortunately, this, is, this is, seems to be part of the human condition. There's nothing new to this phenomenon, and it's always changing. We're always changing what they are. The problem with this is, the moment people start talking about beliefs, they are immediately rendered, rendered stupid. It is impossible to have a rational conversation with anybody the moment they're locked into a belief mode. So one of the one of the questions I get periodically from people who know me from the world of psychology and therapy and then learn about my the, the stuff I do with magic and, and, and that kind of area, they'll say something like, oh, you don't believe in all that stuff, do you? Now, believe in all that stuff. What's the referential index on the stuff that they think I believe in? And if I say, well, what do you mean by the stuff? They'll go, well, magic. Okay, but what do you mean by magic? What is it you think I believe in? Now, of course, the difficulty is I'm being pedantic because they already have got a belief formation about whatever it is they're thinking. And scrutiny and investigation as to what you're actually thinking, why you like having that thought, is not permitted. It's outside of the paradigm. So as a therapist, what I, what I tend to teach my students is that if you're working clinically with somebody and they go into beliefs or beliefs manifest in, in a clinical session, stay out of beliefs. Just ignore them, give them, give them the, the respect, but don't challenge them, question them, give them counterexamples. You just move on quickly, allow them to have that belief unchallenged. Because the moment we do, we get a counterreaction. 
and we get into that pantomime. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. And the more we challenge people's beliefs, the more they'll believe them. So one of the things I would say is, how do you get a Christian to increase their belief in their God? It's simple. You tell them there is no God and start to provide them with evidence. Because the more you do that, the more they are going to go into the reason why there is a God and, and justify it. And exactly the same thing happens in, in delusions and psychosis. So when somebody has a, a, a hallucination or a persecution complex or a delusion going on, um, that's nothing more than, than a very strong belief combined with sensory evidence that they're receiving in, 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 their, in their way. The more we tell them that's not true, the more they will argue back how true it is and the stronger the hallucination and delusion will become. So in re things like therapy and reality orientation, trying to get people to see a different point of view is completely counterproductive, as anyone that's had an argument on the internet has had. The modern, the modern Facebook phenomena, I believe this to be true. Oh, you're an idiot. That's not true. Backwards and forwards it goes until one blocks the other one. And then they give a status update telling everyone how proud they are to have been blocked or to have blocked the other person. It's the modern thing. <laughs> This is how yeah. we deal with people's belief disagreements. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty sad, to be honest. And it's not just feeling sadness. It is sad. But <laughs> so <laughs> you, have a, you have a pretty spot-on analysis of religion as therapy and therapy as religion. You essentially say psychotherapy is religion dressed up a little bit differently. So I was, I was wondering, I love this analogy. Could you maybe take us through that? So essentially, if we go back before the date, the advent of therapy in its, in its modern forms, which is really sort of post-Freud, really. Essentially, if you had a, um, a mental aberration, a mental problem, this was only to be seen as a spiritual crisis. Because essentially, we, had a, a, we lived in a religious paradigm of existence. And so when things are going wrong or you're lacking happiness or something else is happening inside you, you're either possessed by demons, they need to be exorcised, you're lacking faith or so on. So the, the person to go to would be the priest or the vicar or whatever the religious leader would be. Now, the cure for human malady, and this, this really goes back to think people like, I mean, um, an amazing thinker, and I highly recommend all magicians and occultists study the work of Thomas Aquinas or Thomas Aquinas. He was a, he was a theologian, Christian theologian, who was a, a huge thinker and reformer within the Christian church. Now, essentially, he wanted to see how do we solve human suffering? Simple confession. And, and he was a great one for, for confessing. And he actually really took a scientific approach to, to how this would work. So you meet in a, in a very, very small office, the confession booth or box or whatever it is, where the priest has got to give you complete confidentiality. He is not allowed to repeat it to anybody. And you can just confess and, and say whatever's on your mind. And then he may prescribe a penance, which is you then have to go and do whatever it is you have to go and do, Hail Mary's, whatever and make amends and, and and you go back the next week now freud comes along and then a few innovations after freud and then modern psychiatry emerges with psychopharmacology and we start to lose faith in the religious paradigm and so what we now have is the therapist and they have usually a very small room because it's usually all they can afford um, and we meet and they, they're in total confidence and we are to they're not allowed to reveal anything about anybody although it's different these days and we open up and we go in week in, week out, often for years, talking about how we feel and, and, and our sins as, they, as we see them today. Now, the priest may have prescribed sacraments and behaviors of making amends and prayers and invocations that you have to do to the angels and the saints. The modern therapist gives you a CD to listen to and some affirmations to recite. He gives you a sacrament, often it's like Prozac or Thorazine or Ritalin, whatever it is they give you, and we'll give you some homework to go out and we tell you to have to make amends and to become a better person and read this book and so forth. And they all have their gurus. Now, you have a church which has a pope and a hierarchy of pope, or pope, little popes, popettes, um, and vicars and padres and everybody else. In the therapy scene, um, you have your your chief guru whether it's freud and then the hierarchy beneath freud all the way down but then you had jung you had a split so you had your freudian psychoanalyst and then you had your jungian psychoanalysts and then alfred adler comes along and all these other people come along and you have all these splits just like you have the catholics and the protestants and all the others and they all have their lead guru at the top and then all of the people who've been anointed by them. 
The structure of modern day therapy is exactly the same as the original structure of the church, as it was in its heyday. There's, I don't see any difference whatsoever between the behavior of the practitioners, the therapists and priests, and the behavior of the parishioners or the patients. They're exactly the same relationships, exactly the same paradigms. There's no difference. The problem is most of the therapists who are doing this nonsense have no concept of this idea, and they don't realize that they're just repeating religion. They may even say, you know, we don't believe in religion, and I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, or not a religious person, whilst they deliver religion on a daily basis. Yeah, maybe religion and science aren't so different after all, you know. Have you heard that term, uh, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha? Yeah. Uh, that's what I think of whenever I hear somebody talking about gurus. Not a fan of anyone who falls in line and follows, you know, like your Zachariah Zebedine or whoever that kid was in the back of the line in school, you know, like he always just fell in line because he saw, you know, you or someone else in front of him as the line leader, the guru, whatever. And uh, I just, yeah, I think you just kind of make your own way or sh- or should, you know, it's nice to learn from other people, learn from uh, uh, from teachers, learn from people who have been around longer than you, your elders, so to speak. That's kind of my own philosophy. You know, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. So I don't know now, meanwhile, think of that. in the Thelemic circles in which I, I, I sometimes move, although in, <laughs> less frequently these days. The Thalamites are usually the the, the determined individual. I'm going to reject all this stuff. I'm an individual. I believe in freedom and all the rest of it. And yet what happens when you get a bunch of those together, it's amazing because suddenly they become an in-group who now have formed a tight group of individuals, all claiming to be individuals, who feed on each other and off each other and exclude everyone who's not an individual. And they can't see the paradox of it. So I think a problem with, with individual, individualism and not being a follower is, is this itself paradigm that we just need to escape? And that we, you know what I mean? It's, we can't not join in because by not joining in, you're now doing something. If everyone else doesn't join in too, you've all joined in the thing that, of not joining in. So it's paradoxes within paradoxes. It gets very confusing. Yeah, I'm very reluctant myself to... You know, like, for example, I have felt for a long time in my life a sort of connection or a a draw to Freemasonry. It's always been a group and a set of ideas that have appealed to me. But I am so reluctant to join because of that very reason. Like, I know that they're not, you know, you can bring your own belief system into it, but whatever. It's still something that just doesn't sit well with me. It just still seems like, like you're talking about, you know, with a group like the OTO or the Golden Dawn or whoever. It just still seems like this cult-like atmosphere. And I'm not a fan of collectivism. I know that we're humans, and maybe you could talk to this, and we need community. We crave social connection and more intimate, personal relationships. But I'm cool with just being, you know, walking my own path. And then if somebody wants to walk with me, that's fine. But let's not forget while we're walking together, we're still two individuals or three or four or however many. So from a psychological standpoint, do I have an issue with that? That I don't want to be part of groups? That I'd rather just be by myself? Is is there a psychological (laughs) problem here? If it is an issue, I have the same issue. I think (laughs) I think... I have this idea in the in the magic scene. I think it's a very common. I think it's one of the things that draws people into into things like the occult and magic um, is the need to for individuality. Because I think I think that the, the world of magic, the, the sort of the magic technology, for want of a better better term, does offer a fantastic set of tools by which to to identify your true nature, your true will, your true identity, um, without having to, to necessarily join in. Um, but the joining in can be helpful, I think, certainly in my experience, when you're doing a group, if you've got a group working, it can be very, very useful. I think it goes wrong because an awful lot of people, they forget the the ultimate goal, the, the sort of the salvation of the true identity of the true will. That gets left behind and they do get caught up in the needing to belong. And certainly in the magic scene, it's very easy to be a very big fish in a very, very small pond. And so the magic scene and the different orders are awash with sort of the celebrity occultist or magician. Maybe written a few books, maybe does a few podcasts such as the, you know, they become a name and they're the one that a lot of people will kiss their ass. But if you mention any of those names to people like my mum, the guys next door here, in fact, any, anyone else outside of the magic scene, no one will have a clue who they are. Yet, because 
it's a very small world, very tight world. I think there's this kind of need to make a name for oneself, to try and be better than the others, to be the one who's got the grades. I've got the better apron or I've got the better robe and I've, I've, I've now got the thing around the wrist of I've got a second gold bit now and I've got an extra badge on my sash. There's an awful lot of that ego indulgence that goes on, which when the humour from it is lost, the, the sense of the ridiculous of what we're actually doing here gets lost. I think we end up with a bit of an arsehole and I see an awful lot of those. And then they group together in these humorless little cabals of individuals like, no, I think this is why I kind of stopped joining the groups <laughs> because I, <laughs> I kept meeting those people. I don't, I don't know. I just don't do that very well. I, I, I don't play the game so good. Some people are very, very, they've got the social skills. I, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm in a unique position because I host a podcast where we talk about these occult philosophies and concepts and ideas. But I do see that there are certain people in this community who take on that role that you were just talking about. That that it's this there are these these figures that are propped up in the community as like they're these gurus, they're these experts, and then they create this group of people who are loyal to their teachings and their ideas. And we completely lack the awareness that you're just falling in line with this other person's ideas of what magic is or what alchemy is or whatever the case may be. And I've done my best to, to stay out of that because I don't practice magic. I, I don't practice these sorts of things. I find the entire set of beliefs to be completely fascinating and I want to learn more about them. But I don't want to fall in line with just one person's ideas of what magic is, for example. And I'm rambling a bit here, but it's interesting that you brought that up and threw that out there because, yeah, I think the occult community is just as guilty of that as the religious community is and i just don't think they realize it absolutely i, I couldn't agree more well great you know one thing i, I did want to talk about too while you were here uh, and this goes back to your analogy of religion as therapy and therapy as religion is the dsm the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental yeah. disorders uh, say that five times fast Isn't that but, great? <laughs> yeah this is this is the bible of psychotherapy of psychology yeah. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what exactly it is for people who don't know what it is. But yeah, it's it's really simple. It's a catalog of demons. It is simple. It is a it is a simple diagnostic thing to find out what is the name of the demon the person has, and then we we can look at the behaviors of the demon. It's a list. So the DSM diagnostic it started. I mean, it started back in back in the day. Cut a very very long story short. There was a point where there was only one proper psychiatric drug. And that was Thorazine. That was the first one. 1954, Thorazine was the drug that they could give to, to all these people with all these symptoms. And a lot of them got better really quickly. So the mental hospitals started closing down. Big industry built up around psychopharmacology. They then discovered other drugs and then other drugs and other drugs. Before you knew it, the doctors had this massive array of drugs. They were looking at them and going, what the hell do I give this guy? What they did was they said, if we give you this drug, if we give this one drug to 100 people, what are, the hun what are all the behaviors that are affected by that drug? Make a list. Now we give this drug to 100 people. What are all the behaviors affected by this drug? Let's make a list of all the things affected. Now we have two lists. Now, if you present with this list of behaviors, guess what? We give you this drug. And if you present with this list of behaviors, then we give you this drug. And essentially, that's what started to happen. The lists of symptoms were actually drug responses. The opposite end, you know, the inverse of, its, inverse of itself. That then became a, a guidebook. So doctors would then know which medications to give people. Then insurance, because it starts getting expensive, insurance companies say, okay, we need better guidelines. And the DSM and its modern incarnation starts to take form, which was if you have a set of symptoms, there's a proper disorder, as in there's a drug for it, it goes in the DSM. So if you don't have a disorder, there's not a drug for it, when we're not going to pay out the insurance. That was how it pretty much started. So it was an insurance company thing. Now it just gets bigger and bigger. There's new disorders every year. My favorite one from about 10 years ago, oppositional defiance disorder. So essentially, this is the little kid who hates school and hates you and me and hates everybody because we're all fuckers. Now, it's not because he lives in a tightly controlled, over-medicated society, which makes no freaking sense to anybody. No, 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 no. It's because he's got a disorder of the brain. And here is the list of the symptoms. Now, just because that list of symptoms is in the book, it makes it look like a disorder when little Johnny displays that list. 
So essentially, that's what it is. Now, each set of symptoms, each behaviors has a name, the diagnostic name, whether it's clinical depression, um, involutional melancholia, to use one of the old terms. There's, there's dozens and dozens of different categories. These are the names of the new demons. And the demons can be brought under control, not by you becoming a magician and learning how to control the temple of yourself and the inner brain and all the rest. No, 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 But by taking the sacraments that the modern priest gives you, and he will give you the right sacrament to banish the right demon. Sometimes he gets it wrong and you have to switch. But these are, this is, this is strong juju. This is strong magic because sometimes the magic is so strong it can make you ill. And then you get all these side effects. Then we have to give you other sacraments to salve your soul and to ease the symptoms. So essentially the DSM, I believe, is, is just the modern, is it Maleficorium? What was that book? Malleus Maleficorium? The old 16th century book of demons is now the DSM-4. Because back in the day, burning of witches wasn't a punishment. It was a treatment for being attached to Satan. Because they were freeing the soul from the contamination of the devil. It was a treatment. Yeah. You know, I should have told you this before we started talking or earlier in the conversation, but I took some psychology courses in college as elective courses because I've always had an interest in how the brain works, neuroscience, psyche, you know, so I wanted to learn as much as I could and I would get the latest edition of the DSM just for the fuck of it, just for fun, just to read through it and see what see what was new in it, because it was interesting to me. Like like you said, the, it got bigger and bigger, and they added all these new disorders and these new symptoms. And the thing that why I stopped reading it was because well, one, I woke up and I was like, this is this is some bullshit. Because I started to see creativity talked about more and more in modern context as a link between mental illnesses. And it, I was majoring in creative writing at the time, so I got to be almost offended by that. Like, well. How is creativity a link between mental disorders? And I was wondering from your perspective, as somebody who deals with this, you know, every day, is creativity a bad thing? Or is that just one other thing that just doesn't make sense because, you know, society, the scientific paradigm is trying to really, you know, constrict the psychological movements. I don't know if that makes any sense. But. It's, it's not it's the whole all of the whole psychiatry model to me, the whole DSM. Um, reasoning. It, none of that makes any sense to me. I think the whole thing is just inherently corrupt and corrupted. But I think it's important to understand how these things come around. How does um, a new disorder appear? And essentially, there's no there's no global conspiracy. There's no big pharma conspiracy to make these things happen. There's no sort of machinations in the background making it happen. There's just thousands and thousands of people worldwide every year trying to make a name for themselves and trying to trying to earn a living. And so you have somebody who graduates in their psychology degree and then they go and do their PhD and then they go and work in a psychopharmacology department and then they get involved in a research trial because that's a good job opportunity that comes along. And they're favored by the company and they say, well, you know, have a look at this thing. And the next thing you know, you have an individual who's going, yeah, shit, man, I can, I think I found something here. And they get a grant and the company gives them money and then they, they go into the hospitals and the clinicians go, yeah, I'll make you a few referrals. You can have a look at some of my patients because we're not doing very well with these guys. Now, that repeats all over the place is is a huge, great machine that is generate the machine generates these new disorders. And then the research paper gets published and then they might be successful with the press releases on that research paper in the in the journal. And then a newspaper picks up on the story and the meme is now created. And now you have people reading that newspaper story going, wow, you know, shit, my Johnny, he's only five, but he's always kicking off at school and he kicks me all the time. I can't, he hates me. Maybe he's got that opposite, that ODD, maybe, op was he called oppositional, def oppositional defiant disorder? Yeah, maybe that's what Johnny's got. Oh, is there a medication for that? Now, collectively, this thing starts to gather pace. Now, we have all sorts of secondary gains built into the culture. So... Johnny's always getting in trouble. I'm always coming up at the school because Johnny's in trouble and I'm a bad, I'm not a bad parent anymore because Johnny's got a disorder. And now because he's got a disorder, the school have to do something. They have to make special permissions and allowances. And, and so it goes on. And so this huge machine starts to grow as more people now, meanwhile, social worker or, or classroom assistants go, well, I need to make a name for myself. I, I can do better. I can specialize in this new disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, because I can work with people like Johnny because I understand him. Now it's becoming a thing. Now that being repeated all over the world all the time, that's where these things come from. Now, 
weirdly, are they all coming from the same portion of people's need and understanding and psyche? So is this actually the manifestation of an archetype that collectively we're all investing in and we're manifesting it into the world? So now we're actually taking something from deep within the psyche that we all have and we're putting it out there into the physical world. So again, is this just magic, but by, by a different name? But it's not good magic, but it's dressed up to be good. And I think this is where the danger lies, is that for an awful lot of stuff, we can see that, okay, that's bad. We shouldn't do that. But when it's dressed up as being good and it's therapy and it's nice and it's supposed to improve people's lives, that's really dangerous, especially when it's having the exact opposite effect in culture. So point blank then, if I came into you as a, as a client or patient, I don't know what term you actually might use for that, but and I exhibited signs of, say, creative problem solving, would you mark me down as having a symptom of a mental disorder? I don't know. I wouldn't because I don't believe in mental disorders. And I've got to be, I have to be very, very careful how I say this and where and when I say this, because it's, it's very, very difficult to, to, to get people to understand the different paradigm that these things are actually socially, socially organized in creation. Because if you then put a person who's a blatant schizophrenic with all these florid symptoms in front of me, they go, well, what the fuck's that then? That's a person with a disorder and a mental illness, because that is what it looks like in that, in that paradigm. But if we change the context around those symptoms, we change the paradigms around the symptoms, we don't have a disorder anymore. And we actually have a very, very different thing. It's just that it's, we've changed the paradigms that exist around people so much, people are now alien to their own realities. So I think we are making all forms of creativity an illness. It is, it's nuts. As you say, it, it's, it's quite, <laughs> quite a worry. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, you mentioned NLP at the very beginning of our chat here, and you threw out the term linguistic program a little later. I'd like to give people a, a crash course on that subject because it's something that I have an interest in. Uh, obviously, I haven't been able to talk about it with anybody yet, but this is a term, neuro-linguistic programming, that I'm sure some listeners are familiar with. But for those who aren't, you know, what is NLP exactly and how does it relate to our greater discussion here? What I would I recommend to any, anyone listening to this, if they've, they've made it this far, and if you have, well done, congratulations. But I would recommend anyone listening to this to go and study NLP. But don't believe the hype and, and stay away from the practitioners. I think that's probably the best advice I can give. NLP, Richard Mandler, John Grinder, um, two guys got together and they started looking at patterns of excellence. And what are those patterns? They started modeling out and passing out behaviors. And they also started looking very closely at the language patterns that people use. And their models were largely ways by which to understand people's communication structures. Because communication isn't random. Now, we have the fields of psycholinguistics. That's been a long established field. But what they were doing is, is applying this to very specific areas of experience and application. So, for example, rather than looking at why does a person, what motivates a person to do what they're doing, what we can do is simply go, well, how are they doing it? And if it's a problem, teach them how to do something else by finding the something else, modeling that out. So we got the structure of it and teaching them how to do that instead. So essentially, it was a way of codifying both linguistic expression, but also the underlying thought forms that gives rise to that um, linguistic expression. They say it's the study of the, the structure of subjective experience. What it means is this. We can look at not just what you think or why you think it, but actually look at the structure of how you think it in order to, to make changes very, very easy to make. So that, that's the basis of NLP. Unfortunately, it then, because it caught on very, very well, I wish it, rightly so, because it is, it is worth, worth studying, it also attracts in, I think it's probably the modern-day alchemy Alchemy was had a lot of good stuff going on, and a lot of people then go, "Oh, I can make some money out of that. We can turn lead into gold." And, and next thing <laughs> you know, that then becomes the prevailing notion that gets fed back to people. Alchemy is about turning lead into gold, and that's it. NLP had the same thing happened. There's so many practitioners all trying to make money, all trying to make a living, making a living out of just talking to people. The claims just got ridiculous. But the core NLP models are fantastic. I'd recommend everyone looking at John Grinder's work and Richard Bandler's work. Could you break down some of the modeling for us? So supposing somebody is depressed, they say, I am depressed. I will immediately recognize that as a, as a complex equivalency. Is the NLP term? I is equal to depressed. 
So it's like density level stuff. So I can now that because I the, the way things are structured out, that gives me a, a selection of responses I can give that match that structure. So I could go for evidence based. I could go, well, how do you know you're depressed? And then that may reduce it down to a kinesthetic because I feel it, uh, or I tell myself. If, I, if they say I tell myself, uh, what are the words they use when they tell themselves? Now, this all sounds very banal and all very simplistic, but actually it, you will start to get some very profound information about people uh, and about how, how they think. I've probably really done a bad job of giving an example here. Does NLP sort of fall into – it sounds like – it might pair well with something like the biology of belief or some new age law of attraction type stuff as more of like a linguistic property of that. Is that kind of what we're talking about here? We see an awful lot of that. There's, there, this is why I say you've got to stay away from the practitioners. The claims that get made go into the, 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 the nonsense. Um, so there's people saying, I can heal cancer. You can, you can learn how to control your body. You can learn to, to control your mind. I've been forever asking these guys to give a demonstration of this. And I've always said, if you can control your body and, and pain like you claim to, well, let's do a video together. I'm very good at inflicting pain. Um, <laughs> you, you do your pain control, let's demonstrate this, and let's just see what happens. Obviously, people won't, won't go for that. So there's a lot of claims made. Essentially, this is a way of understanding language, and it's a way of understanding how people think. Now, out of that came a whole bunch of techniques which enable for some quite profound change to occur. For example, the, the, the NLP phobia cure, I think, was one of the most fundamental, I mean, one of the most profound things they came up with. If you ever see someone with a genuine, true phobia, so we expose them to the stimulus and they go white and keel over and you know they lose consciousness, their phobic response is so great. That's a massive shit. That's a very powerful problem. And using NLP, usually within 10 to 20 minutes, you can get rid of that. And there is an easily demonstrable, dramatic change in somebody's physiology and mindset that is very, very easy to produce. And most simple trainings can teach you how to do that. And it's quite an easy thing to do. We can take people who've got some quite depressed thinking going on. They, they talk to themselves in a really bad way. They're always giving themselves a hard time. They are their worst enemy. Leave them alone with their thoughts. And, oh, my God, they're horrible to themselves. And then they suffer the consequences of that. We can teach them to stop doing that and do something else very, very quickly. So you can take someone who would otherwise be a lifelong depressive and maybe in just one or two fairly short sessions, you can create a transformation with that. This is fantastic. But it's not the cure for cancer or the grand unified theory of therapy. In some instances, for some nature of problems, it will work brilliantly well. For other things, you have the issue of the recipient isn't going to be suitable uh, or the practitioner isn't suitable or the relationship between the two is not suitable. There's all sorts of other stuff that goes on that may incapacitate the ability to actually do this work or not. Yeah, it's a fascinating theory. It's something that I stumbled across a few years ago, and I, I didn't practice it. I didn't have it done to me or anything, but, you know, it was on the surface. It seemed like, wow, this is this is a cure-all for, for you know, psychiatric disorders, even though you just said, and I agree with you, that there are no such thing as mental disorders. But this reminds me of something you said in your video about scrying on your website, which scrying, by the way, you did not define as, you know, gazing into a crystal ball like John D and Ed Kelly did back in the day. More of like visualization techniques, if I recall correctly. But in your scrying video, you were talking about kinesthetics, kinesthesia, and I'm trying to be careful with how I word this, but it seemed like you sort of shit all over new age concepts like chakras and even yoga practice and maybe even herbal teas, if I remember correctly. But you find these concepts of like a like chakras or even yoga. Like, do you see them to be sort of bunk? I guess. No, I don't. I, I see. I see the practitioners of most of this stuff and the new age adherents to most of the stuff to be bunk. The actual say, if we just look at say chakra chakra stuff, uh, for most people it's wishful thinking. There's nothing going on of anything other than belief and wishful thinking. Basically. Just come to, I don't know what it's like over in your part of the world, but if you go to new age fairs over here, where you have a hall full of chakra healers and color healers and aura soma healers, and all, it's like a fucking mental asylum. It is nuts. <laughs> and you know what? There is nothing going on apart from collective delusions and, and they're having fun. And that's, you know, no bad. That's not to dismiss the, like, I, I dismiss most NLP practitioners. But I don't dismiss the model of NLP because I think it's fantastic. The same thing with things like chakras and yoga. So 
what people are doing in their nightly yoga class at the uh, sports center or leisure center or the community center is not what they are doing in the yoga schools in India where people are studying this thing as a way of life and they know the philosophies and everything else. For an awful lot of people, it's, it's a bit of exercise, it's a social club, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an evening activity. And I'm not dismissing those things, but it's not yoga. For an awful lot of people, their meditations, their, their chakra work and practice is not anything that's happening that we'll see in the Hindu mystics or the Buddhist mystics. There's no relationship at all. What they're doing is a bit of fantasy and a little bit of creative visualization, but it's not actually anything happening there. It's an escape from their day-to-day existence. Here I am going through my life as a normal person, and in the evenings I go off and do my chakra work and my yoga, and then I'll go back to being a person. Now, at some point, I might start to introduce that yoga work into my office. No, thank you. I won't have coffee. I will just have a chamomile tea. And here is me now being spiritual. I see that stuff happening all the time. They're not being spiritual. They're being idiots. But that doesn't make me a popular person. Yeah, I can see why. I mean, uh, especially, you know, people cling to their yoga and their chakra cleansings. And hey, you know, I actually do yoga. It's very much Western exercise type of yoga. It is not spiritual Eastern yoga like you were just talking about. So, I mean. So so basically like myself, you probably, because I do yoga as well. What we do is stretching. It's fancy stretching. Yes, absolutely. It is fancy stretching. I mean, I could sit here and just touch my toes and call it a day that's what some people think yoga is and i think that's exactly what we're doing but it's you know the different poses and stuff obviously you're activating some muscles perhaps that you don't normally activate in your daily life you know your your sedentary office existence but it has helped me it's made me feel better physically but i i wouldn't say it's a spiritual experience by any means like it probably should be but one of the other things that's related to this, concepts like clairvoyance or clairaudience, you know, I think these might be also grouped into new age neuroscience, maybe perhaps is a, a term I might have just coined. But what do you make of, of these, I don't want to call them phenomena because I don't know if they're real, but it's this... absolute nonsense. Okay. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> now, here, this is this for me is a bit of a problem because okay, so here I am telling the world, I, okay, I'm I'm a therapist and I'm a magician, but clairvoyance and, and mediums and, and clairaudience are, are fools. How does that even work? How can I how can I do that? Yeah. I think they're into the realm, and it's basically it's based on experience. Back in the day, where I was I was younger and and still looking, I, I, I went to a lot of both seances, mediums, and clairvoyance both shows, but also temples and groups. I was, I was forever going to these things. What I was hoping to see, you see, was a physical manifestation. What I began to realize was they were all doing exactly the same thing. And then I went off and studied cold reading. And I was able to do a clairvoyant show or a medium, mediumistic reading far better than those guys were because I basically learned the, the cold reading technique. And I did. I, I used to do it for pints. I used to do this in bars. And I would go and read and also trying to get laid. <laughs> I could go and read people's psychic whatever or talk to a dead relative, and I was really good at it. And the whole thing was just a routine I had learned. And the, the difficulty I have is most of these most of these clairvoyant stuff, if you actually look at the result, look at the people doing it, listen to listen to the kind of ability they have as a person. It's not it's not the high IQ club, and this makes me sound such a snob, and I and I am. I can't I can't pretend any different. But there there's something very low rent about psychism and all of that supernatural end of stuff, which is really the the area of sort of the occult that I think is it's fantasy. My first sort of introduction to the occult was you know walking into like a bookstore and seeing a section labeled New Age, and perusing the titles on there and seeing books written about topics like this. and the, But the, the more that you actually learn about magic, it's two very different phenomena. But I was going to say, too, um, what about the idea of intuition, then? You know, that sort of feminine aspect of the self. You know, this might bring in uh, Jungian concepts, too. I'm not sure. Maybe this idea of the shadow and shadow integration and kind of combining masculine and feminine properties. And that feminine property that I think that a lot of people are most familiar with is that idea of the intuitive senses that we all get. You know, these are... I don't think you can call these, you know, clairvoyance or clairaudience or telekinesis or whatever other words you want to throw out there. But from a psychological 
practical standpoint, you know, from your perspective, what about intuition? Is that a very think, real thing? I, well, it is, but I don't think itself is a thing. I think intuition is a collection of things that come together, the, the experience of which or the results of which we call intuition. So we have, we're taking in sensory data all the time, some of which we're aware of and some of which we're not aware of. We also are very, very good at spotting patterns of behavior. Many of us can, can look at a group of people and we can, and if you put in there a person who's got a slightly criminal intent, you can spot them quite easily if they're not masking it. They might just by the way they're dressed, the way they're stood, the expression on their face. And because we're very good at spotting certain things. It's the basis of stereotyping, of course. We can get it go wrong, of course, at the same time. Plus, we have all of the, the behavioral cues, the environmental cues, our previous knowledge and experience. We are very good at predicting the concourse of forces. So when a car is flying down the road at high speed towards the junction at the end here with lots of elderly people, I might think, shit, there's going to be an accident. And of course, there's going to be an accident. There may not be, but eventually I'll be right. The phone rings all the time. Um, I'm always thinking about different people. Occasionally, one of those people will phone while I'm thinking about them. And, and so on. You know, so there's lots of things around coincidence and patterns and, and so forth and sensory data, the calculations that we make. I think those are the things that then give a rise to what appears to be intuition. And of course, there's also then the, the observation of bias. We always notice when we're right. We quickly forget when we're wrong. Yeah, but yeah, when but, somebody else does it, it's the other way around. You quickly point out when they're wrong and sort of forget <laughs> when they're right. So I can give a, an example that I, I saw. My, my background, I was a nurse in my, my former life, and I worked in neurosurgery. And there's a thing about neurosurgery that makes it quite a special place to work, and that's the unbelievable stress levels that go with it. Because in most departments, if you make a, a simple mistake, basically you have a quite a big gap before there's any consequence starts to emerge. In the neurosurgical department, you make a mistake, you can have a catastrophe happen almost immediately. So you, people have to become very, very switched on very quickly. And this was devastating to people's health. This is one thing I recognized was the mental awareness that seems to be required of people actually was quite devastating to them over time. But one of the things most nurses learned to spot, and I, I learned this after about a year, I would know when somebody was going to have an epileptic seizure. Because in, in the neurosurgical department, you get a lot of seizures happen post-surgery, and, and they could be quite problematic to, to the patient's recovery. Yet, I became extremely good at being able to predict who was going to fit when. And other nurses could do the same. And I remember one day I walked onto the department. I, I wasn't even on shift. I was just dropping something off. And I walked past, and I looked at the patient as I was walking past the window, and he had what I called the look. He was just sat up in bed talking to his wife. He was just chatting i said to one of the nurses uh, i just he's got the look she knew exactly what i meant we prepared the bed and as we're setting up he had a full-blown convulsion all nurses could do that now the thing is when i was asked how do you know this was an nlp practitioner trying to find my model of how i did this i don't know how i'm able to tell you that now i know it's based on experience and there is some sensory data that i'm receiving and I know the other nurses have the same thing, but it's not some supernatural metaphysical thing. But I also know it's outside of conscious awareness. So it appears to be some metaphysical thing. Like I feel the energies. I feel the aura. But maybe it's not that at all. It's just very astute observation on minimal cues that are outside of conscious observation. Yeah, yeah. That does bring to mind Carl Jung's work with the, you know, the collective unconscious. And I mentioned the, the shadow integration a few minutes ago when I, when I proposed that question. You know, while I have you here, I, I do want to talk about a couple other things. You know, let's start with Jung, for example, as a psychotherapist. What do you make of Jung's idea of the shadow? Because that's that's an occult concept as well, especially when you look at something like alchemy, you know, taking that lead and turning it into gold, for example. What do you make of that? It's an area of Jung I've not studied. So I, I, I may be speaking incorrectly here, my understanding. I think, I think my understanding is it's right because the dark side of ourselves, the whole area of ourselves that's outside of, con we don't have conscious access to it. And yet it motivates us and we behave in all these different ways. I know as a therapist, integration of the different aspects of personality, integration of identity is really, really important. Medicating it away ignoring it denying it banishing it is one of the most unhealthy things people do and the collective cultural denial we have around everything is phenomenal um so it's no wonder that people suffer in the way that they do so i'm i'm in favor of my the bit that i i think i understand that's completely fair 
So as someone who treats depression and trauma, what about other areas of treatment like uh, psychedelics, you know, specifically things like LSD or MDMA? MDMA specifically seems to be pretty effective at treating depression in recent clinical studies. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, you know, do you see these as viable treatment options? The, The cultural narrative around these drugs is beginning to change. And it's changing for the better because there was a point back in the Timothy Leary days where they were using these these agents with with phenomenal success. I mean, Leary's work with recidivistic prisoners, for example, again, very, very effective. Then society changed, culture changed, government changed, punitive thing. And so people have learned, you don't take LSD because you'll think you can jump out windows and fly. You know, and all these things were bad, drugs are bad and all the rest of it. It's beginning to change. The, it's it's going to be a long time. And the problem is, if it takes too long, governments change, social trends change, media reporting changes, it can swing back again and we start throwing people in jail in massive numbers again for for daring to do it. The potential on the psychedelics in terms of psycho-treatments is enormous. And the research is there. It's been there a long time, especially in things like substance abuse. Ironically, using a psychedelic to treat substance abuse like alcoholism and heroin is very, very effective. There was the Ibogaine experiments back in the 90s, which again, phenomenally effective. The problem is the cultural narrative frightens people. So my son is 18, I haven't got a son, but my son is 18 years old and he's got all these problems. And I'm going to go and trust him, given how much I know my son and how much he suffers. And you're what you want to give him LSD? Don't you know how bad that is? Now, the problem is within that paradigm, that's going to be a damaging thing to do to that guy because. He may well have the LSD. He's already got the cultural programming, how bad it's going to be. But then he comes back to me. And now I can I can now project onto him all of my concerns and fears, and, and so can everyone else. It's problematic because treatments don't exist in isolation between the treating clinician and the recipient because they're all part of the greater cultural narrative that supports that. So I think the potential is absolutely enormous, especially with things like mescaline and mushrooms, the psilocybin mushrooms and, and treatment of depression is phenomenal. And we also know that a single, it's, it's great, the single dose of a psychedelic can actually render a person nice. We can take a neoconservative Daily Mail, you know, this is one of our conservative newspapers, not very nice publication, someone who's really fixed on that cultural mindset. And a single dose of, of a hallucinogen can actually take them out of that and they start adopting liberal views and all sorts of other more open-mindedness, even if they're not subjected to any therapeutic process whilst they're tripping. So the potential's there. The problem is we're still associating it with abuse. And while the potential is there and we associate it with abuse, there are all those people who do go and abuse these things. And we still have a mass, because the society as a whole doesn't differentiate between a therapeutic drug and a drug of abuse, we still have huge numbers of people who will always be trying to take these things just to get high, have a good time, make some money off it and join the gangs. And, and all. There's, always, there's always going to be the criminalization, criminal element of any substance that, that is used that creates a change in mind. And then the media reporting. So ketamine, very, very powerful agent, something we used with enormous success in emergency trauma when I worked in, in, in the emergency rooms, um, and also in, in general surgery, ketamine is used. Fantastic drug. Yet how do the media always refer to ketamine? It's a horse tranquilizer. That's insane. And that's what everyone thinks it is. Why would you take a horse tranquilizer? The potential is there. The education of the public will take a long time because we've got to stop people writing the headlines that are selling the newspapers with the scare stories. We've got to start chucking people in jail for daring to alter their states of consciousness with a third-party agent that's not sanctioned by a doctor. It's just insane what we're doing to people. Yeah, people are completely okay, you know, drinking their six or eight diet Coca-Colas a day and don't see that as drug abuse when it absolutely is, at least in my opinion. Yeah, because apparently smoking, smoking a joint or taking heroin is really bad for your health, which is why we're going to put you in jail because prison is really good for your health. Gang rape in the shower, that's not a damage to your health. Incarceration, <laughs> possibly your job, alienation by your family. No, those things aren't bad for you. Yeah. This is helping you. It's like, who comes up with these ideas? Yeah, I don't. Well, sick psychophants <laughs> come up with these ideas. But uh, yeah, psychopathy in government and institution of any sort is very real. So to bring this all you know, back to magic, 
and specifically ritual magic, you know, for people who are listening to this who do practice ritual magic or who may be interested in starting, I'm wondering what sort of specific magical practices would pair well with a psychological treatment of sorts. Without any exception whatsoever, 100% looking at things like the Goetia and the Solomonic evocation tradition, which sounds counterproductive because people associate that with demons. You can't go playing with demons. But actually, the study of those practices, the developing of oneself to become the master of the temple, to become a magician, to become optimonus, to become that practitioner who can command things of his will, that, I believe, is the number one thing. Now, we don't have to have the robes, the circle, the candles, and a dark place in which to, to, to see these things. We can actually do this philosophically and, and you know, substitute things, like, like I try and demonstrate in the Mentims program. Um, but the... The Solomonic tradition, and I know you've had some fantastic speakers on your on your podcasts uh, from the Solomonic tradition. Um, some of the books that, that are out there are fantastic. But because of the associations, because of the, the Judeo-Christian negative view on these things, because the word demon has all the wrong connotations, it's a problem. Because it's very hard then for someone who's coming from a Judeo-Christian Christian paradigm then to go, okay, so I'm going to start playing with demons. This will be good for my mental health. <laughs> the first thing, we have to decondition the person from all the programming they've had around these concepts. So it's a, it's a, it's a long process. It's a multi-staged process. But I think Solomonic magic is absolutely the way to go if it's done safely. Yeah, you know, in your video series on your Mentem's website, you do talk a little bit about, I think I said this earlier, the, uh, you know, creating the magic circle is a, is a good practice, uh, using the triangle of arc, good practice, using the uh, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, also a good practice to incorporate specifically into these psychological treatment areas that we've been talking about. Now, I do have to ask, though, this is a, a cool application of ritual magic to tie it to psychology, but what sort of results have you seen either in your own life or in your work with clients? where you do incorporate this what results specifically have you seen from this approach i've been sent a very interesting i've actually put this on the website on the kabbalaproject.com website and it's kabbalah with a q for those looking it up at this moment kabbalaproject.com on the goisha experiment or goisha reports pages um, i've put up uh, the full letter full email of a lady in india one of the things I do is I, I teach this this process in, in workshops over two days. And so it's been interesting the feedback that comes back from people and their experiences. Now, this is a lady who has a multitude of psychiatric diagnosis, but also a chronic pain condition. And so she already had anthropomorphication of the pain. Just to cut a long story short, people see pain in metaphor, where it's like, it's like a, a dog chewing at my leg. It's like my leg is on fire. These things are always seen in the metaphor, often anthropomorphized. So what she chose to do was to use the Goetic formula to evoke pain. And that's what she called it. Even just gave it the name pain into the triangle in order to have an interaction with it. Her preparation from that took a long time. And it, the, the, the preparation predominantly was her getting her mindset correct. Because I think it's very easy when you're dealing with a very real principle of yourself to get caught up in the suffering again. And that when you're standing in that circle, you are a magician doing a process. You're not a person who's a victim who's suffering. If that's, if, that's the posi- if that's where we start from, when we have to start again, right back to the beginning, back into the preparatory stages, which could take, could take months or years. She wrote quite lengthy email. I reproduced the whole thing with her permission on the website because I think that's the, one of the best examples I've had from the feedback. For an awful lot of people, the, the, I think the, the number one type of feedback is people feel understood. A lot of people listening to this will have knowledge, pre-knowledge of the Goetia. They will have some understanding of evocation work, magic circle, triangles, that kind of stuff. But a lot of people that come to the workshops, it's interesting to me, why have they come? If you don't know anything about the Goetia, you think magic's all about the demons of the Christian church and all the rest of it. Why would you come to this workshop? But they do. And then once they've gone through all the material, the, the, the most common report people give is, I now understand my experience which before was always seen as a mental aberration. It was always meant seen as a condition, an illness, a genetic anomaly, or I thought I had psychic powers or I was, you know, and now they have a new framework by which to understand both their experience, but also how to go about doing something about it when they, they're having an experience they don't like. That seems to be the most common type of feedback. I was just wondering because 
treatment like this, I mean, any sort of treatment, there's no way it could be 100% effective across all the people who've tried it, you know? So I was just curious what sort of feedback that you've gotten from clients. And so that that seems to be pretty encouraging. Go ahead. I do think it's important not to think of these things in terms of treatment. I mean, I, I certainly don't. I don't see any of the work I'm doing really as a treatment process. Because what am I treating? If, there is, if I believe there's no such thing as a mental illness, and, and there isn't such a thing, then what, what are we treating? Essentially, we're teaching a person a different way of thinking and understanding. I think that's essentially what I'm doing. Now, for some people will be able to apply that effectively because they both have the ability and also what they're applying it to will be amenable to these processes. Some people won't apply it. Some people won't really know how to. And for some people, they're applying it to simply the wrong things. What are most people trying to apply magic to? How to get, basically, how to get more women and how to get more money and how to be popular and be liked by everyone. Yeah, pretty selfish. And selfish, you know, being selfish can be good, but that's the sort of selfish that's, I think, even more psychologically oppressive. I don't know if, that's, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. But uh, You mentioned the Kabbalah Project. Uh, I wanted to just drop that in here before we go real quick. Explain to people what that is. Right, very simple little thing. Um, I, I run a local group. Um, actually in my house every alternate Monday um, and essentially we're just working around the tree of life looking at the different paths the sapphira any rituals that would be applicable to that particular portion of the tree um, so essentially it's a, it's a Kabbalistic study group I'm getting an awful lot of interest in people going well are you going to do this online um, no not going to do it online because it simply doesn't work because it's a small it's a small group it's very practical what we're looking at doing is effectively franchising it so I give the structure of what we're doing to another person who can then set up a local group. The people who come, it's only a small group of us. It's, it's usually half a dozen to, to sometimes we get as many as nine people. It's amazing. Um, the people who come, it's none of us have anyone else locally who gets what we do. But we all get what we do. And that's, that's, why, we, that's why we do it. Now, of course, what, I'm, what we're getting is communications from over the Internet from other people who see what we're doing. They go, well, how do I find these people? Well, do what I did put an advert in the newspaper, um, start a meetup group on meetup.com. Now, a lot of people can get, but I don't know how to do these. I've never done anything like this, which is why we're looking at the moment at the possibilities of actually setting it up with a structure. We say, okay, this is what you do. This is how you do it. These are the words you use. Um, off you go and have fun. That is Kabbalah with a Q project.com. Where can people find more of your work with magic and psychotherapy? If they go to the kabbalahproject.com website, the, all the links you'll need are on that website. Um, there's a whole bunch of free downloads on there as well. Uh, if you type my name into Google, you'll find that I've got a ton of stuff. The amount of free videos and audios, both in NLP, hypnotherapy, psychotherapy, I've just got loads. Um, I won't go through the whole list now, but if you just Google my name, Andrew T. Austin, that's A-U-S-T-I-N, you'll find them. Um, or just go to the kabbalahproject.com and uh, follow the links on there. Awesome, awesome. I will link all of that uh, in the show notes to this episode, so for anybody who's interested, they can check out the Kabbalah Project. I think you have a personal website, too. I will link that as well. But Andrew Austin, thank you so much for being here. Really enjoyed the chat. Would love to talk to you again sometime, man. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, there it be. My thanks again to Andrew Austin. Check out the links in the show notes if you want more from him I will say that there were a couple of times during this chat where I wasn't quite sure I was on the same page with Andrew, particularly with some of the more unseen, unmeasurable psychological stuff, but I think we got there in the end. I did have someone comment on the YouTube version of our last episode with Carolyn Elliott, and the comment actually applies even more to this episode with Andrew than it does to that last one. And that comment, just a couple of sentences I wanted to share with you, it says this, For a long time... Psychiatry has been used as the brute force, the goon squad, to enforce scientific materialism on the public. The psychiatric establishment has been the thug enforcers of scientific materialism. And I think after hearing this chat, after hearing Andrew brilliantly break down how psychotherapy is structured damn near exactly like religion, I think we could all agree with that YouTube comment. And speaking of YouTube, the show is now on DTube. That's D.Tube. I know that has nothing to do with YouTube directly, but 
DTube is another video hosting site that's connected to Steemit, where creators can get a bit of cryptocurrency for their work if people like it enough. So if you're into the whole Steemit thing or you're into the whole crypto thing, show us some love on there. Just search Oculture on DTube, you'll find us. And speaking of love, a shout out to my man Joey, who became our newest patron this week. Much love to you, Joey. Thanks for coming on board. And much love to Sir D.H. Slammer, who graciously gifted a one-time donation of $33 to the show. Sir Slammer is a longtime supporter of mine. He's known around these parts as the Courageous Magus. And thank you for your courage as well, kind sir. And if you're in the mood to be courageous yourself, please do rate and review the show on iTunes. Check out oldculturepodcast.com slash donate to send a one-time thank you or join our Patreon campaign by visiting patreon.com slash oldculture. If you do join, you'll get episodes at least 12, sometimes 24 hours before everyone else. You'll also get exclusive patron episodes once in a while, opportunities to submit questions to our guests, and chances to win free shit. And actually, our next episode is our first, where we do have some listener questions, and it is a good episode. Who's the guest, you ask? Well, I guess you'll just have to hit that subscribe button to find out. Until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. (laughs) 